helpful to tell is that if you do have a question, raise your hand and then go talk at the mic so that I don't have to repeat the question as Sheila did so nicely. Um, the, so the second thing is, of course, when we, when we last left, we just started by pointing out that uh, um, LLMs don't seem to be solving um, at least even Bloxworld problems. Uh, by the way, the 30% is only for Bloxworld. It actually is much worse. Um, you know, for other IPC domains. That's just, you know, the results are all there in the newspaper. Um, I just focused on that because, you know, something to remember. Okay. Uh, and then we talked about the fact that it's not, it's probably, there's reason to believe that it might not be doing reasoning because it's actually, if you change the names, it's actually worsening quite significantly the performance. And um, so uh, the other questions, you know, I'm just going to walk through part of this talk is this like the, the second part, second part, okay, which is I'll give as much help as I can to LLM to see if it actually solves without me solving the problem and see if it is helping. The kinds of things that you heard about, chain of thought, changing the prompt type, uh, doing the fine tuning, and unfortunately, none of them help too much, um, but I want to go through that anyway. Um, Okay, so the usual ways, and you saw this already, the usual way you can uh, improve the LLM performance is improving the prompting or improving the prime fine tuning. Um, and then in the case of uh, prompting, um, so we tried a whole bunch of things. I just want to walk through them uh, very quickly. So instead of giving um, actually uh, text as prompt, you know, you can give PDL directly. By the way, uh, for those of you who don't know, how planning problems are written um, in this you know, international planning competition. This is a particular um, you know, formal representation for planning problems. It has actions with preconditions and effects. That's called the PDL, and it's called the uh, uh, planning domain description language. This is the uh, names of the actions, and uh, this is the um, uh, initial state and what your goal you want, your goal you want, and the plan would be a sequence of actions. Um, and then I can give a query instance. I can give you an example first, and I can also give a query instance. By the way, we did do zero shot and few shot learning uh, for all these things. I mean, in fact, there's enough tons of data on you know in for the previous part too. I just didn't focus on that. So we also can do few shot uh, learning in this case. Um, and then PDL prompts actually doesn't change anything. One of the interesting things that may actually be seen as a positive thing about LLMs is unlike you guys who probably like English and not, and, and you're particularly allergic to parentheses, you know, LLMs don't care. I mean, it's basically it's a token prediction. It doesn't really matter whether it's it's predicting English or Chinese or PDL. It doesn't really matter, okay? As long as it's been trained on data similar to that already. Um, so that, PDL prompts uh, actually have been used and it doesn't make any difference. That's probably, and, and, and uh, so the other question, one of the other things is we actually considered whether to include the domain model as part of the prompt or not in terms of asking. It's been tried in the literature both ways, but when they don't put the domain model, they still have to make sure that the action it came up with is actually an executable action for which they do ad hoc things like, uh, you know, look for an action that is close similar in some sort of a string similarity metric and try to see if that action works. Again, if it doesn't work, then all bets are off. And um, the second question, second way is actually manipulate that action generation. So go into the LLM's internals and make sure you basically look at what were you about to say for the next token. Normally, you know, basically, as you know, LLMs will just basically sample from the distribution, you know, given what they're learning in the distribution. They're sampling from the distribution, depending on the quote-unquote temperature, they will always just take the maximum probability versus take the other ones too. And so the one question is essentially look at the top K things it was probably going to predict and see if any of those key things are connected to the things that you actually can do according to your simulator. In fact, one of the very first ideas, um, um, is this the one? Yeah, no, actually not this another one. So one of the very first uh, ideas that work, worked on this is uh, SECAN. Um, SECAN basically from the Google guys, 
and they had logits information. Basically, they had the information about what actions are going to be predicted. You and I don't normally have it. In fact, for a while, OpenAI used to give that information. My understanding is it no longer gives it. So you can only change the temperature to just come up with another sample. But if you are in Google, which the, these guys were, and they didn't have to pay for access, so they, with the Palm system, they knew what are the K actions it was about to predict. And then they have a, an RL system which knows which actions actually can be do doable in the current scenario. And then you pick one. So taking my my friend is an idea generator idea. So you say, I am stuck, man. Give me some ideas. And they'll say, OK, do this, do this, do this. And then of them, you see which of the things you actually can do and try to do that. OK, that's as smart a thing as you can be possibly doing. So in this particular case, Essentially, LLM is just giving an action heuristic. That's it. It's just giving an action heuristic among the possible you know, actions that the simulator is about to do. And again, remember, as I said, deep reinforcement learning is so inefficient, so inefficient that any idea can be shown to improve performance. And I'm not kidding. You know, this is if you're looking for dissertations free, you know, there's an idea for you. Okay, so that's SECAN. Um, and then uh, OK, this is what I want to go into. By the way, I did this just for this tutorial, because I know that a lot of people are chain of thought gangs, I'd like to call them. And they want to know what about chain of thought. And so I basically, over last Friday, I was, you know, not I didn't. I mean, when, I, when a professor says I did, they really mean their students did. OK, unless I think probably Sheila is the only exception. She actually does stuff. But you know, so anyway, I gave them ideas and say we should try this. So one of the question is, does the chain of thought prompting work? And then I actually tweeted out, as I said, I tweet everything out before I even tell you here so that I'm using the world as a verifier. I'm an LLM. I'm using the world as a verifier so that you know whether or not people actually find any problems before I tell you this. Anyway, so let's walk you, let me walk you through this. So what is chain of thought prompting? Chain of thought prompting has become a bit of a religion among LLM aficionados. The basic idea is to give LLM a couple of examples showing how to solve the problem step by step. Saying basically do this and this and this to actually solve the problem. And then supposedly then it will try that. So you, you give a problem to somebody and you tell them this is the way you solve the problem. And then you show a couple of times. So for example, okay, I'll show you here is a three digit multiplication. This is how you do, this is how you carry, et cetera. And then I give you one more three-digit problem, and then so on and so forth. And you already know where I'm going with this, that if you give LLMs, let's say, tons and tons of an agent Choi at AI2, who has a lot more money for giving uh, to OpenAI than I do, has apparently given something like 300K to OpenAI to actually fine-tune GPT-4 on something like gazillion pairs of four-digit multipliers. Multiplication. So this is a four-digit pair. This is the answer. This is a four-digit pair. This is the answer. And when it did it, the performance shot up on four-digit multiplication to 98%. This is LAMI, as you know. Okay. The only possible reason why this might make sense is if somehow, after all this, it learned how to do five-digit multiplication. And you know where I'm going with this. You do five-digit multiplication, it falls down to 0%. I'm not kidding. Okay. So there is a paper on this. And, uh, and so, in fact, her paper was also in the New Rips. And essentially, I think hers is called Faith and Fate, um, you know, which is kind of interesting because Ajin actually used to be a lot more positive about LLM capabilities, but, you know, started looking at it and then found that there's obvious issues in terms of reasoning. Okay, so in general, if you tell how the problem is supposed to be solved, the question is, oftentimes, operationalizing that advice requires inference. In general, when somebody tells you how to do something, to apply it to a new scenario, you may have to actually do inference. So if COT really works, the real question would be at what level of generality can you give this advice? Okay, and, and if the human's life has to be simpler, then it has to be the case that the general advice would work. So one of the things that we do, so basically I said it's pretty non-controversial to say that COT involves giving additional task problem specific knowledge. The question is how general this task problem specific knowledge can be. The more general the knowledge, the easier it is for the humans to provide it. But the higher the degree of reasoning involved for LLM to actually operationalize it. So there is a problem, OK? So you, we all want students who can take, do the right thing, guys, and then they'll write papers, right? And <laughs> that's operationalization. I get to say, here's the spelling of my last name. Please put it on the paper, right? That's what the dream students for professors are. 
Whereas what you sometimes get is, here is the first para, and the student says, what about the second para? Then here is the second para, and that's not where going anywhere. Right, so the question is, how useful is it? Um, how, how good is it in operationalizing the advice? So for the planning problems, so the PDL planning problems, we tried um, four different approaches, okay? One is domain independent chain of thought. We know it wasn't supposed to work. It's not going to work, but I was just taking, again, just as I knew that LLMs can't do planning, but I took them and their word and tried to see. And so domain independent chain of thought is, I tell you when you are trying to come up with a plan, check, you know, for a plan to be correct, basically it has to be correct by either the progression proof or a regression proof or a causal link proof. And I'll write this as a prompt. And I want to see whether or not you'll use it. Remember, people are talking about prompts of 1 million tokens, et cetera. So in fact, one of the weirdest things is when we started doing this, one of my one of the worries my students had one or two years back is, would people yell at us because we have such a big prompt, right? Now nobody asks that because that ship has sailed. We can supposedly talk to LLMs by throwing it books, etc. So, so the question then is, I will basically in the case of um, domain independent, I will just tell you what makes a plan correct as a prompt and then see, and then show an example and say how that example follows correctness of the plan step by step. And then, you know, this will become a pretty large prompt. <laughs> then I ask the next question and then see whether it will do well, okay? So, so this is the domain independent cart example. I'm not expecting you to read this. Uh, the slides are available. Basically, you can see a whole bunch of information has to be given to ask, just explaining, you know, how the proof works and how, you know, how, how, how this particular plan is correct in this example. And then I check if, in fact, it improves anything. It doesn't. Again, you are sur not surprised. Yes. Just curiosity, is it explaining how to verify your plan or explaining how to plan? Both. OK, I'm no, sorry. So this one is explaining verify. Next one, I'll show how to plan. OK, I do. That's why I did four things, you know. So I mean, COT is something that's been bothering the heck out of me that I'm, I slept very happily yesterday night because I did this tweet saying it actually is a silly idea. Um, OK, anyway. Um, Hopefully. Uh, the, the other one is domain specific chain of thought prompting in Blocks world, where I'm not telling it how to explain, um, I'm not telling it how to verify the plan, I'm telling it how to actually do the plan. Okay, so there in, in this previous case, that prompt would have worked pretty much for any domain. So it should be able to learn how to solve problems in Blocks world and then be able to do planning in logistics world, et cetera. That's essentially how domain independent planning works. But we didn't expect it to do it because it can't actually do reasoning unless you really believe it can do this. Here, I'm now gone from domain independent to blocks world, only blocks world, just solve blocks world. And those of you, again, this is AAAI, those of you who either played with blocks or are in AAAI community know that there is a dumb idea in blocks world, which is still pretty smart, which is if you have an arbitrary initial state configuration of blocks, and an arbitrary goal state configuration of the blocks, and you need to figure out how to stack the blocks into the from initial state to the goal state. Here's an idea. Undo the initial state configuration such that all stacks are undone so that all the blocks are put on the table. Then look at the goal state and then pick up, put the stacks in the correct order. This is well known. In fact, Dana now, my committee member, basically even showed <laughs> that this is within 2x of the optimal blocks world plan. Remember, none of us ever, by the way, one of the very interesting things we don't do is we don't care about optimality of plans anymore. Just give me a plan that might even possibly work. Okay, so 2x of optimal is still fine. I'm not unhappy with it. You know, I won't get ICAP's paper, but I was trying to check that. So here, we will essentially tell it how to undo blocks, put it on the table, and then stack it up. And again, this is how the prompts would be. That's the prompts. You can again look at it. This is fresh of the things. Um, and then <laughs> what happens is your examples I give, we give are I think two and three stack problems. That means um, essentially any arbitrary initial state, but the goal state is a single stack, not even multiple stacks. So actually it's even more specific than this. And it just needs to construct that, multiple, that uh, stack, except then the initial state, it has to undo all the stacks. You guys see this? It's four o'clock, I understand, but I'm, you're not LLMs. So I hope you can see this, right? Okay, so not surprisingly, if you look at, you know, its performance, you know, it's, you know, kind of good in the, you know, in, in the beginning. And then as the number of blocks goes away from the number of blocks in the initial uh, examples, it falls pretty drastically. 
which means that it cannot actually follow the advice. It's not unrolling it. So you can say one of the words that has lost its luster in machine learning community is the word generalization. What is generalization? Well, for humans, showing how to stack, you know, three block stacking and generalizing it to four block stacking is considered minimum generalization. It can't do that. Okay, it's fine. Well, maybe we'll do something else. Goal class specific. Previously, initial state could be anything. Goal state is a single stack. This time we said initial state, all the blocks are on the table. You don't even have to undo the block thing. Goal state is a single stack of length n. You just have to construct it. I'll show you how to construct it. You're thinking, man, I mean, I can do this. If it's four o'clock, I can do this. Okay. Not surprisingly, this is what I wanted him to do. So here is the domain, examples, and then query. Okay. Uh, this is all, you know, all being run yesterday um, and day before, etc. over the weekend. And <laughs> once again, you'll see the performance falls as you go away from the size of the examples you gave. What that means is you're not able to follow the advice by unrolling it, which is not, not much different from not following the example of going from three stack in a three, three digit multiplication to four digit multiplication or four digit multiplication to five digit multiplication. Am I saying learning systems cannot learn programs? No, I'm saying LLMs can. LLMs are not equal to learning. LLMs is not equal to deep learning. LLMs is not equal to AI. They're pretty amazing. I was telling somebody in the break, humans are amazing. Humans don't fly. That's okay. I'm pretty happy with that. We, we know how to build these metal things and fly in them. Okay, but we don't ourselves fly. And I, it does bother the heck out of me when people say, it's still early in the human civilization, little later humans will fly. And I think, have you looked at the evolutionary tree? You know, that, that ship has sailed. Okay, so I have no problem in somebody like Jan Likun saying a different way of training large scale models might have better abilities. I can't disprove him at any rate, right? And similarly, I have no problem in the kind of thing I'm doing, which is I'll combine LLM guesser with the verifiers. I have problems with people saying, if I don't do anything, Sam Altman will do something tomorrow. That's like a unfortunate thing because at least if the LLM Architecture isn't changing. Why are you expecting anything to happen? So that's goal class. This is, by the way, is GPT-4 done yesterday. Okay. Um, then, so it, it too fails. Finally, we threw in the towel, right? We said, this is chain of thought for lexicographic stacks. That means the blocks are all on the table. The new stack is always in the lexicographic order. So it's always A, B, C, or A, B, C, D, or A, B, C, D, E, or A, B, C, D, E, F. Finally, there, it seems to work. Now, if I only tried this, now if I only tried this, I can write a paper saying COT works for blocks world. And you will all be happy. In fact, I have read, I read a paper where they said, we finally, our planner can also do, our LLM planners can also do blocks world, I mean, no, no, blocks world planning. And I made the mistake of looking into the appendix because the claims are in the front page and you know that you know, the New Rips world appendices are like 250 pages long sometimes. So you should look at it. And what they actually showed was if you are trying to construct an N stack stack, you already put N minus one things in the correct order, LLM can actually predict the last step. That's what the claim was. I can tell you the papers. I mean, I think I even tweeted about the paper. Okay. But the point being that what one of the biggest issues for LLMs in general is anthropomorphization. These words mean a lot to you guys, right? Chain of thought. I talk to people, I'll give an idea as to how to solve the problem. They do it. I'm doing it to the LLM. Probably LLM is doing the same way humans do it. Please don't think about it. In fact, it's a bad mistake. In fact, taking Drew McDermott's name again, he wrote this beautiful paper called Artificial Intelligence Meets Natural Stupidity. This was way before in the last time AI was like in the hype phase, right? And then he basically said, don't write a program called understand, bracket begin, bracket end. And say, it looks like it understands, so it must be understanding. Call it Gensem 007 and see if in fact it shows understanding behavior as you know validated by some benchmarks. 
right? And that is the thing that is sort of missing because we anthropomorphize, you already called it understand, and you know people understand, so we are assuming LLMs do that same thing. And see, people follow chains of thought reasoning, so you're assuming LLMs do too. The word thought is actually the most unnecessary, unfortunate thing that has been introduced and people read it again. Once you write it wrongly, you will basically read all sorts of unnecessary meanings into it. And once you fall into that cognitive trap, you're likely to need this kind of a tutorial to kind of try to pull you up. Okay, so a summary of the effectiveness of the chain of thought prompts, as you can see, the ease of giving COT advice worsens drastically as we go from domain independent to domain specific goal to class specific goal to goal specific to lexical goal specific. If I have to teach a student this way, I would expel the student. Life is too short. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's all advice is not created the same. High level advice is easier to give. Lower level advice is basically, and then where they're only able to solve, you know, if you tell them how to do a four digit multiplication, they can only do four digit multiplication again, is not as good a student as one who actually figures out how to do multiplication. Yes, please go ahead and talk. So this is really interesting. Thank you for sharing this. I'm thinking about the graphs that you made. It seems that at least for the small problems, it is able to solve the problem with a very high yeah. percentage. So um, I, I think we can we can conclude that it can't reason or plan, or we can conclude that maybe it can't unroll. Yeah, that's my point. Maybe the issue is not the my, fact my, that it can't reason, is, but maybe is, it has the problem that I, it can't do for loops. I think I basically use the word unroll multiple times in the tutorial. Right. But in general, most interesting reason. reasoning winds up including unrolling. So for example, even database people have realized that you can't call databases in, you know, intelligent because they can retrieve what you put in the database. That's why there was deductive databases. And people like Sheila and Hector Levesque were laughing their heads off saying, okay, this is still you know, small compared to what knowledge representation system is supposed to do. So to me, reasoning, it's very reasonable to say, can you actually do chaining and unrolling? And that's very, very important. If not, the information you have to give to LLMs is going to be a lot more laborious. The thing that nobody talks about, and it's okay if you don't mind it, giving it. I mean, in fact, I don't mind. We all spend tons and tons of time teaching our kids, mostly because they're cute, right? I don't know how we teach LLMs. It seems to me a sad way, as I said, screenscaping kind of a thing. Why would you want to do something like this when it is actually cognitive burden for the humans? And at least you should understand that there is a cognitive burden in giving how to solve this problem, but then I have to give another, another chain of thought if the problem changes slightly. Go ahead. While I have the mic, um, you have been saying that they don't, I mean, they can't reason. I just wanted to uh, double check whether you mean they can't reason or whether you mean they don't reason today. Are okay. they making a representability okay. argument? I, no, I, I think that's the difference between humans don't fly. And no, you're no. saying, do humans fly? Are you saying humans don't fly today or they won't fly tomorrow also? My sense is, I'm actually saying both. You are saying sense, both. LLMs can do reasoning of the in retrieval time. I'm not talking about AI. Please understand, I already no, repeated no, no. this. LLMs by themselves, I would be very surprised if they're actually able to do unrolling. Okay. Is there and a representability argument here? We have to talk about it. We'll write the paper in the night. But, you know, as of now, you know, it's important to realize that they can't do. And, you know, we already put in a lot of effort in this particular thing. And certainly certain kinds of, so basically I would say that databases do reasoning too. Because if I give you base facts and I say is a particular theorem true and the theorem is in the base facts and you say it is true, you have done reasoning. It's just the dumbest form of reasoning. It's the simplest sure. form of reasoning. That's sure. why most people don't take. No, no, no. I, I take that argument. But I also want to take the argument of, let's take any um, reasoning algorithm. It is actually making a series of small yes. arguments yes. in order to get, yes. think, our consistency. What you are, yeah. I mean, again, let me, okay, let me, let me actually take my um, privilege and say, sit down right now. Okay. I will get to the verification where I will talk about CSP verification and that might add more and then we can talk more. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, thank you for questions, by the way. Uh, I just, I thought, how am I going to fill three and a half hours? But then I remembered, how am I going to complete in three and a half hours? So that's always my normal problem. Um, so anyway, what if we fine tuned LLMs with successful plans in the domain? That is something that people still do, okay? You have to ask yourself, why are you doing it? 
you have to think about whether the fine tuning is helping generalization or not. And remember in the back of your head that fine tuning trillion pairs of four digit multiplication doesn't seem to improve the fifth di five digit multiplication. That's not the kind of fine tuning I want to do. Okay. But so remember that. And again, as I said, this is a go file arm. I think I already showed you. People do write this. People actually make lots and lots of synthetic data just to see if LLMs can be shown to be doing it. This, by the way, is a Rube Goldberg. And I think of Lamai as the Rube Goldberg AI to some extent, you know, doing very simple things. This guy has invented a nice machine which without self-operating napkin, he doesn't have to use hands. It just easily, you know, wipes his face. The question is, you know, is that a reasonable thing to do? That's the thing that you have to ask yourself. But what if we fine tune LLMs with successful plans? We actually did it. Lots of people said positive results. We did it in the paper in the new rips, and we didn't essentially get any major improvements. Okay, this is despite the fact that I've already putting extra number of, you know, um, number of plans being given. Again, it depends on what is the generalization. If you only looked at blocks domain, you know, like only looked at, let's say, it shouldn't be surprising to you that if I only trying to solve lexicographic stacking and I fine tuned on a huge number of lexicographic stacking, it will do quite well because it already showed, I already showed you that COT with just a couple of examples, it was able to do that. The real interesting question would be whether it'll be able to do the other ones. That's the generalization that you should be interested in. Um, and then I think, you know, Palagani, I think Biplav and his group have also looked at it. And they also basically show that LLMs have essentially have limited generalization potential. So it's a question is, you know, the important question is, what are you getting? What's the bang for the buck? You know, you spent all this time training four digit multiplication. Are you at least getting the five digit? If you, or do you care? That's the important. Training, one of the things that actually people asked, and it just happened to I have to happen to have it, is there is this thing that's making rounds called large action models, LAMs. And we didn't know the name, but we did this kind of a work in 2016, which is empty transformers with no pre-training, just trained on plan sequences. And this was actually an AMAS 16 paper, which was way before transformer architecture, and it's essentially sequence prediction. You train to predict sequences, and you can show that it improves plan recognition. It can also do some very primitive kinds of planning. It doesn't have, so even if you just forget about all the pre-training and you only did just for the planning, and in fact, there was a whole bunch of um, uh, rumors about Q-star conspiracy, Q-star stuff in uh, OpenAI. I used to call it Q-star Q anon. For those of you from the outside, other side of the border where there's a QAnon going on. Um, everybody was guessing what they might be doing by this Q-star thing. And one idea might be that they were just doing synthetic data for specific classes of problems, tons and tons of synthetic data, and trying to train LLMs on that. And so that would be like, you know, basically the same thing that you can do in fine tuning and they can do with the empty, um, you know, sequences. We did this in 2016. After Transformers came, there was another group, I think, uh, Sergey Levin and Go and Peter Abil. They called it Decision Transformer. Essentially, again, a sequence learning, except with the transform. Right? It can be done, and it will have all the same problems. In fact, pre-trained models might have some advantages in terms of the ability to guess a uh, no, lot more, whereas these ones are lot basically pretty much connected to the fine-tuned data. Because there's the only thing that's happening is the fine tuning, right? Because it's an empty model to begin with. Okay, can LLM self critique? Um, and that is a paper, there's actually two workshop papers and there's another paper on the web, uh, but I'll want to go through this. That in general, there's a bunch of people who think LLMs may not be able to generate plans, may not be able to generate proofs, but they can critique proofs, they can critique plans. It always looked to me like a silly idea. Why? Because generally people tend to think verification must be easy because computationally, verification is of lower complexity for many cases than the generation. For strips planning, generation is p-space complete, verification is polynomial. Okay. Now, it is true that verification is computationally easy. But the question is, why do you think LLMs can do computationally easier problems much easily 
than computationally harder problems. In fact, as I was telling somebody, imagine, in fact, LLMs take for any question, if you ask LLM, you know, unless like they did RLHF and said, don't answer this question. If you asked LLM, here is a program, can you, can you check whether or not it will hard? Those of you who have made the mistake of taking computer science know that's a undecidable problem, halting problem. LLM will guess, guess. Will it take more time? No, it will guess. And it may be right, it may be wrong. Okay, in general, the time it is taking depends only on the number of tokens it generates. And weirdly enough, people have gotten crazy enough that there are papers, I'm not making this up. There are papers which say, maybe you make it talk longer so that it will take more time producing before saying yes, make it say a lot of things, including somebody said, put pause tokens. I'm not kidding, this is a paper. As I said, I want to name names. I forgot that particular one I don't want to name because I don't have the heart to name. And because that seems like such a silly idea, honestly, right? It's like, you know, if you basically, if you take more time, the, the, the problem seems to require more time. So you just take more time. When you ask people to say, take more time, it might actually improve their performance. Another weird anthropomorphism, where you said you put pause tokens in the LLM prompt and hope for the best. And believe it or not, tea leaves can be red. People have shown that for some random distribution, they can improve performance a little bit. And that's a paper. Do you really believe that it makes any sense? It's like in physics, for example, the minimum thing you do is if somebody says this is an equation and you do the LMT, by dimensionality analysis, one side says L, one side says T, you should say, can't be true. Its sanity test is violated and you should be worried about it. Okay. So anyway, can sell LLM self-critic? I basically didn't believe it. So we actually checked in this particular case for once, we checked both for planning and CSP, which is graph coloring, one of the graph coloring problems. It's a very simple uh, problem. And we did a whole bunch of uh, experiments. And this is the one where I basically showed you um, that LLM self-criticing ability is actually with the self-critiquing LLM's performance worsens, doesn't improve. Like I said, if you don't know right from wrong, go with the first instinct. Because if you try to critique, then you are likely to actually get into bigger trouble. And in fact, there is you know, significant analysis of this, and it basically points out that they can give both false negatives and false positives in terms of verifying the partial assignments, for example, in the case of graph coloring, or the partial plans in the case of plans. So for self-verification to work, you need to be consistently high accuracy. Otherwise, you'll go off in the wrong direction. It's very easy to show that, in fact, these things actually just die. They do worse with the self-verification. Okay. And on the other hand, as I said, in the if you do it LLM modulo and you have the verifier in the loop prompting it, saying, try again, try again, and the verifier stops only when it knows the plan is the coloring is correct or the plan is correct. That works. That improves the performance. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so that's LLM self critic equity. So this, you know, one of the things I said, I'll do it for planning too, but I want to do this. Why do people think that self critiquing helps? I mean, I, I don't, I can't help these pause token people. I mean, I don't even know how to give them the benefit of doubt. Okay, but most of lots of other people can be given benefit of doubt. Okay, so the question is, why is this divide in the self-critiquing claims? Some others do report the results that seem to indicate that some form of self-critiquing mode seems to be helping solving. Why? One very important thing I want you to understand is explicit versus tacit knowledge tasks and binary correctness versus style. Many people wind up using improve the essay kind of problems. There is no actual compact verifier whether which gives a direct way of checking whether the essay is improved. As I said, you know, I can make an essay better for some Indian style and then the Singapore people will say what bad English and the Canadians are always nice but Americans will say bad English too or something. Because there is no actual standard practice of what is a good essay. Whereas there is a standard formal representation of what is a correct plan. Correct plan. And what is the correct coloring? What is a nice plan is a different story. 
correct plan, you know, as long as after those actions, you reach the destination, the, the goal. After many, many plans that do that, if you have extra preferences, those are style preferences. Most people actually wind up using these sort of um, essay improvement kind of things for which essentially there is no way of checking whether the LLM was right or wrong in its criticism. How many of you have submitted papers to paper, uh, conferences and yelled at reviewer to because they said the English could be better? It's the thing that reviewers do if they don't have any other idea. The English could be better. I mean, how can you prove them to be wrong? There is no objective way of proving them to be wrong. It's a kind of a criticism that's always right. Okay, so if you basically, so the point is to be able to say false positives, false negatives, the way I did, I need to have an objective metric. Since there isn't any, any guess is as good as any. And so that actually helps understand why people are claiming some of these things. And in fact, the tide is already turning. Now there are papers, you know, after our paper showing that oh, it looks like a self critiquing doesn't work. It seems to work only when there's full moon, stuff like that. I mean, not exactly full moon, but in general, there is, you know, variations on kind of walking back the claims. Okay, even things like hot pot Q&A, which by the way, I think is a silly uh, benchmark, um, where essentially they said, without uh, self-critiquing, LLM had 99.8% accuracy, with self-critiquing, it became 99.6 accuracy, something like this. So the problem is extremely easy for LLM to begin with. And I am talking about problems that it can actually solve and I'm showing that, you know, self critiquing doesn't help. Okay, so that's one thing to this thing. The other thing is, you know, approximate retrieval and one of the other things that can actually help in criticizing, this is actually a trickier thing. And this is actually coming up in the co-pilot. Okay, on the web, we put all the stuff that's correct are the stuff that we wish is correct. We put much less of the stuff saying, here is a bad essay, here is a good essay. Here is a bad idea, here is how you improve. In fact, there was this beautiful statement um, attributed to Carl, Carl Gauss that uh, people said, when you give a proof, you just give the proof. You don't give the intuition as to how you came up with the proof. What blind alley is that you tried so that I can try to do the kind of proofs you did. And then Gauss said, Gauss being Gauss, said no self-respecting self architect leaves the support structure in place when Taj Mahal is complete. He didn't say Taj Mahal, but building is complete. And once you go to Taj Mahal, you think, how did they build this? Because you have no idea that at one point of time, there's this support structure. In general, the corrections data is orthogonal to correct data. And our web doesn't have it. OpenAI found this out the hard way. They had to pay people quite significantly to get corrections data for certain kinds of problems. If you read the paper, do it step by step, they paid a ton of money to get corrections data. Okay, and, and so that's another way of understanding why people were essentially missing the fact that, you know, self critiquing actually isn't working. Um, so again, this is, you know, can LLM self critic This was actually the workshop versions of these papers that were presented in the FMDM workshop at New Rips. Um, and then, um, you know, I think people basically mostly agreed as far as I can tell, and, and nobody has been able to question and show that in fact, for reasoning tasks, self critiquing actually helps. How about if humans prompt iteratively? That's other thing. In fact, that's the earliest thing that was tried. And you have to remember that is the problem of clever hands. Um, humans doing verification and giving helpful prompts to the LLM. The problem is unless they are not, unless they're careful, they can actually give away the answer and then give the credit to LLM for coming up with the answer. How many of you have done as gone to astrologer or parrot astrologers, et cetera? Maybe at least you don't have to admit it, but the point is many of them will make you give the information and feed it back to you. That's a pretty darn good thing. LLMs don't have that malicious intent, but you might very well be giving away without knowing if you know the answer. And if you don't know the answer, as I said, how do you know that it's actually correct? Then you'll say, I checked the Google. And in fact, as somebody said, you know, there's all these influencers on Twitter and who say, 
chat gpt does these hundred things that, that improved my efficiency so much you too should use chat gpt and there's this one funny it's actually a mathematician i think who said chat gpt does this i'm using chat gpt and i'm basically doing much better i basically asked chat gpt to follow this thing and then it, in 20 minutes i'm able to find a solution that i had to google before do you see what I'm saying? Google apparently is extremely hard to do. So whereas by playing with the chat GPT, they actually in 20 minutes, they're able to do this. And that's sort of, and basically that's our problem. Humans basically have that issue. This guy wanted his horse to be doing arithmetic, right? Somebody who didn't care about horse doing arithmetic had to come into the thing. And so as I said, that's where, um, you know, um, reasoning ability is typically prompter knowing the answer winds up being very important. It's the same reason why Bing, chat GPT, Bing, you know, search engine didn't go anywhere other than, you know, putting Google on a defensive because, you know, you can't, you basically, unless you're doing it rag, which is essentially call original Bing and then figure out the high quality answers and summarize them. And even when you're summarizing, people are now finding that they can introduce errors. You see what I'm saying? But it's much less so. In fact, actually, uh, there's a beautiful way Tom Dietrich was asking somebody, how do we make sure that there is no leakage from the pre-training data in the RAG usage? What that means is, how do you make LLM to only summarize what it's been given and not bring in its background knowledge? Because if it starts, quote unquote, bringing in background knowledge, it can start actually messing up the answer. That's where the hallucinations come. Because as I said, hallucinations is the standard, not the exception. RAG, on the other hand, is good old fashioned IR and vector DBs, okay? And it's just, that's how it became popular. So it's like you get the RAG and then you use LLMs to, you know, do format change, okay? Um, so back prompting has these issues. And by the way, so at one point of time, I was so sick of this uh, chain of thought and TOT that I wrote this great paper, which I wish I completed the rest of it. It's forest of jumbled thoughts prompting, an ultra general way to use LLMs for solving, planning, reasoning, world peace, and climate change tasks. And I think it's one of the best abstracts that I've written in my life. Um, it includes such great gems as we prove by reduction to Rube Goldberg machines that the Forest of jumbled thought prompting eventually makes LLM solve any problem for which the prompting graduate students know the answer. And the closer to NeurIP's deadline, the higher the chance, actually. Okay, uh, you should read this, amazing. But I mean, I think this is this and the other thing is what how I'm trying to make my money. But anyway, my point is, it was sort of looking at the zeitgeist of essentially suspending disbelief. And that's the thing that bothers me. We are supposed to you know, celebrate what is useful, but don't suspend the disbelief. So finally, I did the bucket list and I did a quotation of the day in New York Times where I gave an interview and they actually made me quotation of the day one day. So if you don't know the answer to your question already, I would not give the question to one of these systems. This is what I said, because unless you know how to verify, don't ask LLM. Unless you know how to tell a good essay from bad essay, don't ask LLM to write essays. In fact, it's not surprising. By the way, how many of you know that if any of your students say, I delved into, you know that they call chat GPT. Apparently there's a thing that chat GPT has a very high likelihood of delving into stuff. And nobody normally delves that frequently, right? And so if say delve is like a shibboleth, you know that they may have used it. And in general, unfortunately, people using chat GPT to improve their English are the ones who don't know how to write English well. So it's like a, you know, you can reach a level of mediocrity. You know, I myself, you know, I speak English so well that I never use ChatGPT myself. Anyway, um, the important thing is that this is what I said in May of last year, and this is what the guy running Palm project in Google said. I am sure he was fired after that because, you know, all the, all the companies want people to say LMs are working, but he do say the same thing. And it's not surprising. They're still very, very useful and they're not factual. Okay, so that's what that was for. Um, so the one other thing connected, and I kind of brought it up earlier on, is um, doesn't Copilot for Code show that LLMs can plan? Now I mentioned this already. You know they're writing code, and if you can write code with the guarantees, then you have solved planning problem. In fact, Drew McDermott, and again, I don't know why Drew McDermott has become such a uh, background thing today, but he actually has a paper saying planning is really automated programming. 
it's that sort of saying, you know, a polynomial time problem is really something that Turing, you know, can the Turing machine can solve because it's a much harder problem to do automated programming. And planning people try to make things simpler and hope that they don't actually have to deal with the real automated programming with its guarantees. Okay, so what happens in the copilot is there is always humans in the loop, and you know, woe be unto those companies who are basically just putting copilot code out into the world. You know, they're in big trouble. Okay, and the other thing I mentioned is GitHub and General Web are very quite different in terms of the quality of Carpora because GitHub Carpora is actually a higher quality code. People don't put you know wrong quality, bad, not working code as much. Whereas you know, there is no, as I said, there's no um, 4chan for GitHub. Uh, there's a much longer discussion on this. You know, this is a Twitter thread. Um, you know that you can look at. Uh, so this was in a Newlips paper with the poster, etc. And this is the plan bench where we gave a bunch of planning-related tasks, including generation, replanning, verification, etc. You can try that. So looks like we showed that LLMs can't plan in autonomous modes, at least in, from our direction. But then, as I said, there are tons of papers that seem to suggest that they do, and uh, so again, just as I did for the self-critiquing, I want to understand why this divide. What are people missing? Or what are, you know, mutually, what are we missing in these claims? Um, again, that's basically blind man and elephant. All the men in the blind man and elephant are doing the right thing, except they, you know, they're each missing some you know, part of the bigger puzzle. Um, so what planning, it is a thing that, that seems to help me. Maybe it'll help you, so I'm giving it to you. What planning is and what LLMs are good at. Planning as used in the common parlance involves planning knowledge, actions, preconditions, effects, general recipes, task direction schemata, old cases such as case libraries, and then plan generation verification techniques, which is interaction resolution and analysis, plan merging techniques. Uh, the guy who did plan merging is still there, Chang Yang. Uh, plan merging requires actually reasoning if you want to guarantee that the merged plans are correct. Plan merging techniques, plan modification techniques that I did for my thesis. We were basically doing PhD at the same time. And so this was the stuff that you know connected to planning in terms of reasoning part of it. This is the knowledge part of it. Um, LLMs are actually good at getting the approximate versions of this knowledge. That's what I've argued, that they're actually good at guessing models. Okay, they're not correct, guaranteed, but you no, know, they get them much better at that. But they are not good at doing the verification part. Classical, quote unquote, you know, GoFi assumes that somebody is just going to give me the models when I need them, and I will focus on how to do the reasoning part. So they're both missing some part of the problem, essentially. And so LLM Marjolo, you're using LLMs to actually come up with the model, but then you're using verifiers drawn from the reasoning technology to check whether the plans that are produced are correct. Okay, so that's worthwhile to understand. Uh, LLMs are actually very good at coming up with approximate plan general suggestions, HTN suggestions. By the way, one of the big things that you will find is it was extremely hard for machine learning systems to see what seems to be causally impacting something else. That's very really hard because you can't learn it from the examples. LLMs are very good at predicting it because we wrote, unless we are flat earthers and we have a lot more you know, time on our hands to write flat earth theories on the, on, on the internet, more or less, they basically give you reasonable guesses on the causality. And let's take that for what they are good at and then try to you know, use that, essentially. Okay, um, but then they lack the ability to stitch the recipes together to ensure that there is actually they're actually interaction free. And so we check this, by the way, in, it's there in the in Europe's paper that you could take PDL domains and make the interactions between the actions go away by, for example, not having them interact by removing delete so that all actions just add. It's a happy family. Okay, and the secondly. Remove preconditions too, so that every action can be done anytime. So levels of relaxation of the actions. And if you relax the thing to all the way to preconditions as well as deletes are removed, you see that the green part increases quite significantly. Green part is the correct problems, correctly solved problems percentage. There is still red part because if I give it five goals, it needs to put five actions to support each, at least an action to support each of the goals or make sure that the actions that it has is supporting all the goals there. It can't even count that. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why there is red part still there. 
Okay, so but you see that if you reduce the interactions, you know, LLMs can actually guess better because whatever they guess to begin with doesn't need much of plan merging that I'm sure you know, Chang Yang will tell you. Plan merging is if you can just take a plan from here, a plan from there and throw it together, anybody can do plan merging. Most of the time you throw two plans, they don't work, live together well. They will start having interactions. And saying, I'm sure it'll work is a bad idea. Um, so then how come LLMs are trumpeted as doing uh, planning? As in most cases where LLMs are claimed to generate executable plans, are closer examination turn out to be the cases where LLMs are getting by with generate approximate recipe step. Okay? And generate approximate recipes for common sense domains, such as wedding plans, for example, are quote unquote travel plans for a while, although that has already changed. Um, are convert tasks into approximate task reduction schemas. A lot of them claim that we know how to use LLMs to split the problem into smaller sub-problems. I'm not questioning it. It's not enough. It's just basically that's part of the planning knowledge. They're good at doing that, okay? Um, convert tasks into approximate action plan, perhaps written out as programs. In particular, you can even output stuff as code. And so code as policies paper actually does this. And for us, it's very impressive. Honestly, if somebody just converts piece of text into iambic pentameter, you sh we are all impressed. We don't know how the heck to do it. But that's something that we don't have that LLMs are very good at doing. So if they can actually guess a HTM schema, they can also guess some Python piece of code, both of them with no guarantees that they're correct. But the Python piece of code actually is syntactically Python piece of code. So incremental interpreter can at least flag you some syntax errors if required. And then you can come in and, and correct it. If they don't, then you actually try to in, you know, execute it on the external simulator. And if the simulator is forgiving, you might get something out of it. And most of the time when people say, we don't actually have any verifiers, they use simulators. Here is a clue. Simulators don't grow on trees. Okay? Worlds are there out there before you. Simulators are written by people. And those people could also have written you models and verifiers. It's just a question of what you like. And it's very important to understand that when you have a simulator, then you have avoided dealing with the real world. Real world can be non-ergodic. If you get into a corner, you may not be able to come out, and then there's no LLM after that. Whereas a simulator, you can restart all over again. And somebody wrote this faithful simulator that winds up being an actual you know, verifier you know, for, for that particular world. Okay, um, so the other thing is interaction resolution search part is either pushed under the rug, which is basically, I'll give you an example of people saying, we know how to do travel plans and wedding plans, and they don't work. Because at top level, all weddings are similar. Like, I know that Karina, Anna Karenina quote, all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in very different ways. All happy weddings are alike. The reasons weddings fail is because in the last minute when you need the ring, somebody hasn't actually bought the ring. And somebody didn't buy the chairs to have people sit on the chairs or something or other. Interaction resolution is extremely important. If wedding plans can be downloaded, you don't need wedding planners. Are we spending all our time? And we don't admit it. Okay. Um, so R has been part of to human prompters who are required to give hints to the LLM to come up with plan variants that are more correct. So the humans are doing the work. And if you read it carefully, you will see this. I will show you some of the examples of the existing work that has been lots and lots of citations, which all actually wind up doing. OK. Um, there's also one other interesting thing that surprisingly people seem to have trouble understanding, which is confusing acting with planning. Weirdly enough, ICAP's community thinks acting is where it's all at because we know how to do planning. But Doing acting is something LLMs are extremely good at. You can always invoke an external service. But whether or not your invocation of those services will lead to desirable ends is very, very questionable. Having LLMs deal with outside, you know, verify outside accesses and outside um, um, actions, invoking outside actions, which apparently, you know, OpenAI wants to do is really the main worry of AI safety. That's like having a, a gun in a home with a toddler. Although I'm insulting the toddler there because the toddlers actually have system too, okay? But in general, 
you have that, the actions they do may not have the right desirable consequences. Anybody can start the action, you know, which is orthogonal to whether the plan is correct. And then people actually confuse that. In fact, when anybody tells you, but what about AutoGPT? What about Langchain? Say, well, what about web service orchestration? Okay, somebody orchestrated. And Biplav and Sheila have actually worked on trying to see what part of it can be automated. Not a whole lot, but there is a possibility if you have deeper models. But in general, most of the time, the level at which humans can orchestrate web services is a much bigger step. But people are doing, not LLMs. Um, this conversation, this thing actually works for, I mean, this characterization works for React in a monologue. I have slides about them. I hopefully will get through this. And, and there is a different issue about tree of thoughts, but tree of thoughts actually combines two very different kinds of problems. One is 24 puzzle, which is given four numbers, put um, you know, arithmetic operations between them such that the result by arithmetic rules is 24. The other one is improve this essay. Do you see the difference between the two types of tasks? One, there is a binary correct, not correct. The other one is where all the happy things happen because nobody knows what is a good essay. And in fact, we show that much of what Tree of Thoughts does can be handled just as efficiently by asking LLM to just give 150 guesses and check if any one of them is correct with respect to a verifier. And those of you who think where is verifier in tree of thoughts, most people think this. Arithmetic is built in for all the operating systems. Thankfully, they don't use LLMs for arithmetic. If so, they would have been worse on that. Okay. Um, okay, so this is, uh, so travel planning. A while back, uh, it's been pointed out that it's now all over the place, but in, in a while back, you know, Amazon suddenly found that there are tons and tons of, the, you know, there's a New York Times article saying that tons and tons of travel planning books. And there's this guy called Rick Steves who lives in um, uh, Seattle. He writes travel planning books for a living. And in fact, in the old days, I would see who are the fellow Rick Steves people because we'll all be standing in the same place to take the exact picture because the book said that's a good place to take a picture from. And that was like, 29, 2095 or something. And these bozos were writing LLM generated and DALI generated pictures and travel planning books out of very fast. And people say 19, 29, hey, let's get 19 out of the book. And there's an entire New York Times article saying these people actually will go there and find that that museum is not open on that day. Okay. Or that something else is, in fact, one of the funniest things that's about, you know, Rick Steves is he'll tell you, for example, when I was traveling in Italy, that he'll say, you have to call this crazy number to get a code so that you can avoid standing in the line for Ufwitsi. Anybody can go to Ufwitsi and then you'll get stuck in the line. Or it might not even be open. So people who bought this stuff felt very unhappy because they were not actually useful and so they were all returning these books. This was happening. And this was happening at the time when people thought travel planning is something that you know, LLMs can do. No longer now, because in fact, as of last week or something, even people in NLP community who basically had a lot happier, um, you know, happy-go-lucky view of planning have realized even travel planning is hard. So they actually came up with a travel planning benchmark. If you think blocks world is hard and travel planning is where it's at, here's a travel planning benchmark. And they show GPT-4 does 0.6%. And you thought RAV is being mean. Okay, they don't do planning. It's not even RAV's fork. This is travel planning benchmark. Okay, and so that sort of tells you that basically the people are slightly figuring out. So again, um, you know, I already told you about the divide in the self-critiquing claims and why that is the case. And I also told you about the planning part. So the last part is the same roles of LLMs in planning. And I'll show you a few things. So what if we allowed LLMs to interact with external planners and verifiers, or solvers and verifiers? So this is your thing that I already showed you and I walked you through it. Um, instead of this entire architecture, I'll show you pieces that we have done and our other people have done. So one of the things is I just, we just, you can use LLM as heuristic. It generates a plan that's incorrect, but then it is then fed to a planner, which then tries to modify the plan until it becomes correct. That was the first idea I came up with. That is a dumb idea. Um, because I'll tell you why it's a dumb idea, but it works. Okay. So we gave it to LPG. LPG is this local search planner. You give the L, you know, LLMs plan 
to LPG, and then it improves it. And we can show that the guess that L LLM gave is easier for LPG to get it to the correct plan than the one that it randomly guessed. Works. There's no problem with it. But I am happy to tell you, I have no, you know, no, no, no compunction telling you that you can do much better with LLMs than calling LPG because you call LPG, you have to deal with LPG's expressiveness restrictions. A better idea is I prefer basically verifiers to solvers. That's why LLM modulo has a bank of critiques, not the bank of solvers. And the critiques can be constructive critiques, but I don't want necessarily solvers because solvers tie me down to their expressiveness. Um, so um, essentially we have this bunch of critiques. And so one of the pieces of work that we have done is with a single critique, um, essentially do the back prompting. And we can try back prompting in terms of try again, or try again, here is a, um, a missing a precondition, or uh, uh, here, try again, here are all the missing preconditions. So you can give criticisms. And the verifier here is a val verifier, which basically, it's like basically works off of a PDDL model. And you will be asking where the PDDL model is coming from. In this case, I assume that it was given. In the next part, I'll show you. You, you can learn that with the, okay, with the LLMs, with the human in them. Okay, so that's the back prompting with LLMs. And again, that's in the, um, the, and then the VAL system is basically just a verifier that Derek Long and co did. Um, so if you have automated back prompting with external verifiers, you improve significantly. Again, the only reason it's not 100% is we limited the number of times we ask LLM to generate guesses. So 15 is the maximum we said. Within 15 guesses, it got up to 82%. Not a bad thing. You see what I'm saying? You can be a very good guesser without having guarantees. And that's the point of you know, using LLMs. Okay, so you can increase the number of guesses you allow, and then it actually can, these numbers will increase. And then you know, we are from university, we, we have to pay for the tokens, et cetera, so you know, we are poor. Um, so the, one of the other things is, this is actually where one question, this is, I think I'll show it to you with the TOT, but since it's coming here, I point out to you that if you want to reduce the number of guesses, you need to diversify the guesses that you are coming up with. TOT basically talks in terms of problem agent, et cetera, but really if you look at it under the hood, it's just trying to diversify saying, human saying, for example, in the case of planning, it would be, let's say something like, Next, you know, make sure that your guess starts with A1 in this branch, A2 in this branch, and A3 in this branch. That increases the diversity. But that is very different. And in fact, we actually show that if you allow LLM to just generate 150 candidates and the verifier checks if any of the 150 candidates are correct, you can be equal DOT's performance. Instead of 15, 150. So you don't even need to go back and forth, essentially. So LLMs assisting human planners is actually a very useful thing. You know, you can try it, and we have done that too, where basically, you know, you look at the plan and you try to verify. But as I said, you know, that's fine. If it works for you, it's fine. But don't necessarily say that LLM solved the problem. You still have to take the responsibility if you are taking the plan that it generated. And you are the one who is actually verifying. Um, one problem with LLM assisting human planners is automation bias. I know this is AI community. We don't care about humans that much. Um, but in general, automation bias is this problem that humans tend to assume that if a machine says something, it must be right. You are smart humans. You yourself do it because that's what most of this tutorial has been about. But in general, people tend to believe it. And we have seen this in our tests too, that even when the system was incorrect, sometimes you know, basically humans said, yeah, this seems like a better plan. Okay, so they were actually suspending their own good judgment and taking the LLM's um, response because they thought it's LLM. We paid good money for it. Um, okay, one other very interesting thing is actually, <laughs> this is Daman's work. Um, so the idea, Daman is actually um, a Mausam student. This is like a happy-go-lucky family of people that I know here. Um, so we were basically looking at the following fact. Verifiers that I look at are logical verifiers. But you can also think of verification as a learning problem. It's a discriminative verifier. It basically looks at a plan and says yes or no. 
So the question then is upfront, there is no reason to believe that the generation accuracy is somehow worse than discrimination, the, the verification accuracy. But on the other hand, if you're fine tuning and you've been given like thousand plans, normally people just fine tune it to generate. But you can also fine tune it to improve the discrimination of capability. And those of you who know machine learning, you know that discriminative learning has a lower sample complexity than generative learning. And so for the same number of samples, the relative improvement, our guess was relative improvement in the discriminator might have been better than the generator, so much so that statistically, at least the plans are more correct if you do this generator verifier uh, loop. Okay, so here now the verifier is almost like a style verifier because it's just basically saying yes or no. And this was a paper in um, FMDM um, in ICML last year. Um, I mean, no, KLR in ICML last year. And that basically shows uh, that actually does work. And that makes sense. I can understand why it makes sense. Of course, it's my idea. So I mean, I'm involved in that idea. So I can understand that. Okay. Acting versus planning, I already mentioned this. LLMs can obviously be used to invoke external actions. Um, as I said, web service orchestration frameworks, but then it's the people who are actually doing the orchestration and you need to separate that. Um, LLMs can themselves be expected to plan this orchestration. That's the point that you should be hopefully able to get out of this. Okay. Um, normally, one thing that people tend to do is do this rag kind of a thing where you know, hopefully give LLMs a place to write its internal you know, results and then use that to write the orchestration plan. It's not that just because it writes something outside, it suddenly becomes better. I mean, how many of you have seen uh, Memento? Right? Memento is an LLM with an external memory, except, I mean, Memento is like LLM with an external memory because this guy starts writing on his hand, but his, this guy's rest of his brain is working. It was just that he had the anterior something, something where he forgets what happened that day. But he was able to reason once he has the facts in life. Okay, so if you have external memory, you still have to write the actual orchestration program. And people are writing it and giving credit to LLMs, which is fine if it's useful. Like, you know, I, I, you can give credit to Word. You can give credit to Excel because it makes your life simple. But don't say Word is writing essays. Word makes writing essays easier. Maybe you can see the formatting or something. Okay. One other thing before I go into this uh, TOT and uh, reflection, et cetera, things is to understand critiquing occurs in these very different ways. Mostly I focused on the logical critiques such as plan correctness, color correctness, et cetera. But I already just showed you one example, uh, two examples. One, I talked about style critiques for things like, is this plan preferred by humans, et cetera, kind of thing. And also discriminative critiques that are learned. That's the previous work that I looked at. Um, in general, you want to see that external model-based verifiers doing the critiquing, a verifier working off of a, these are all the differences, a verifier working off of a separate, independently certified domain model in case of planning, that will be VAL with PDDL models. A variation would be a simulator that can verify, critique the LLM plan. That's a kind of a verifier. Somebody wrote it. It's just in a different non-declarative form, procedural versus declarative. Critiques can be sound, but not complete. That's one of the things that we talked about. That's why we have a bank of critiques. There can be several sound critiques. They're basically saying, if I give a badge saying it's causally correct, it's correct, but it's not guaranteed that the entire plan is correct, which is the reason why even with the experts certifying mission plan, we have O-ring disaster. Real world planning can be hurt in general. Now, the other possibility, remember that the simulator is in this because it is like a verifier. It's basically somebody wrote it. Feedback from the world is, if it is world really in the raw, raw in the tooth and claw, it, would, it may well be non-ergodic, in which case actions that you do, you may not be able to come out of them. And so if you have bad plans, you actually take consequences for it. This is what people's safety worries should be. If you give acting abilities to things that don't have plan uh, and they just directly work in the world, then there can be major downsides. Um, also, by the way, world doesn't provide helpful critiques while you know verifiers and simulators can saying this is wrong, etc. I mean, most of the time when when you when you stub your toe, when you fall down, 
you know, Mother Earth doesn't say, oh, you made the following mistake in that last step. That's the reason you actually fell. It doesn't, Mother Earth doesn't laugh either, but that's a different story. But in general, world does is a very ungenerous critique. And it's also non ergodic And so people saying they're getting feedback from the world, ask, they ask yourself, what kind of world do they have? They must be having a very forgiving world where nothing really can go wrong. And not surprisingly, that's what happens. And oftentimes when people say world, they mean simulator, which is not even a world. Because simulators don't have non ergodicity Even in non ergodic world, they can actually restart the clock. LLMs verifying their own plans is the other thing. As I said, normally for logical correctness, it doesn't work. The two exceptions I told you are you can write, learn a discriminative verifier in some cases. I don't know how far that will go. And the more important thing is style critiques can be influenced by LLMs. That's what I showed you in the um, LLM module of cases. Um, so with that in mind, you can talk of some of the papers that have basically been discussed a lot in the literature. React, for example, does supposedly chain of thought prompting on a certain kinds of planning problems. Again, with not much interaction, mostly, you know, essentially just sort of chaining a plan. And they wind up having essentially a simulator. So they have like an external sound verifier. Okay. And again, depends on, you can't use React in Blocks world and assume that it'll do any better. That's the point, okay? Um, three of thoughts, I went through it already multiple times. In fact, you can show that we can come to within 4% of the TOT on 24 puzzle by just sampling 150 diverse guesses from uh, the LLM. And so you don't need the whole metaphors of problem solving agent and other stuff. There's a lot amount of discussion in this tweet thread that if you're interested. It's not clear to me whether the authors wanted to mislead people or people basically read the paper that way. But that's why I wrote that tweet thread as the way people misread TOTs. And you know, it's much better to think of it as top diversification, which can be possible, but it's not the usual A star search with the child generator where there is actually guarantees that the child, children that are generated are actually legal child children. Um, LLM itself as a world model simulate and verify the outcome. This is one way where you actually, you don't have to learn the very model supposedly, but on the other hand, if you actually normalize everything, our sense is that basically it winds up doing more errors because it's actually guessing the world model with no human in the loop to correct it which gets us to our part. Um, I'll guess that we are out of. Uh, so this is, which I'm, I'm going to guess, skip this too. Uh, and I want to talk about model construction from LLMs. Um, so since models are something that, as I said, planning knowledge is something that LLMs have the ability to provide you. So the one thing that we did is, you know, essentially use LLMs to get PDL models for various domains. And, and then correct them with the human in the loop and then check whether the human did more work or less work with respect to if they guessed the domain model themselves. And then once they correct it, then that can drive the simulate the, the critique, which is model-based critique. So this is another NeurIPS paper. And essentially, so you can think of this as LLMs are constructing the world models, but they're being verified by the human in the loop. Because otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. If they can't construct plans, how come they're suddenly able to construct the world more? Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of steps. This is a knowledge acquisition stuff. In the context of planning, people always used to think that there's some people out there who are interested in writing the domain models, and the we'll, rest of us will just focus on how to do reasoning with those models or, or search with those models. And this is actually about how to get those models from this sort of a universal approximate knowledge source. And and then, you know, essentially it has some advantages and there are ways in which this PDL model is another way LLM is being used to help in the planning task because the critiques that it is using are being driven by these domain models with the human actually correcting the guest models. Okay. And so that's the, as I said, there's a, a new paper on that. Uh, and then in general, I pointed this out to you that this sort of short circuits the whole old knowledge engineering thing that much of these steps LLM can be used plus human in the loop 
to hopefully reduce the knowledge acquisition, model acquisition task. Um, this is what the ICML paper I was telling you that 2022, we basically showed that if you have a wrong incomplete model, symbolic model of the domain, you can use that to significantly speed up a downstream deep reinforcement learner. And what you wind up doing is under pretty generous conditions, you will wind up getting these things like landmarks, that is a set of sub goals that you have to pass through to get to the goal. And those sub goals can be computed from the model that's been given to you. And then deep reinforcement learner working off of a simulator tries that as a search control advice. Notice that nothing that it's doing has violated anything I said about LLMs not, doing, not being able to do planning because they're essentially giving heuristic advice to an underlying you know, LL, um, the deep reinforcement learner, which are actually using a simulator to begin with. Okay, and then, so what we wound up showing essentially is this kind of models in that particular work, my students wrote the bad model. Bad models are, LLMs are very good at coming up with the bad models. Do you see what I'm saying? And so if you have RL with a simulator in the loop, that's basically like model guessing and then laboriously checking, you know, that as just a non-binding advice for the RL um, search. And that can actually be quite useful. Um, code as hierarchical policy is another piece of work that's, uh, you know, been, you know, gotten a lot of it, uh, attention. And in essence, what they are doing is the, the code that they wrote is basically pieces of how to do certain goals, but not how to combine them necessarily. And if you are in domains where you can do multiple plans and merge them by just concatenation, code as policies is for you. Okay, and, and so that's the way to understand what is happening. And then the, the code, guessing the code is just as easy for LLMs as guessing the domain model, because the format doesn't phase LLM generation. That's important to know. The last thing is the style issues. And so things like humans might have preference about better plans versus worse plans, given that all plans work. And that is one thing that is actually implicitly present in the data that is on the web. And so you can actually, and also there is no direct way of proving whether this is a better plan or a worse plan. There's no logical correctness. It's just people like traveling in such a way that there's like, they, you know, they may be like a plane, plane travel. Or for example, you say this particular type of walking is better than this other type of walking because it's more awkward. Or this particular essay is better than other essay. These are all style issues. And LLMs are actually pretty good as style critics because there's no other game in town, really. That's the reason they're better, okay? There's no other game in town. Um, and so we show, for example, in HRI this year, there's a paper talking about both the fact that LLMs are reasonably good at checking whether certain plans are kind of legible and explicable to the humans in the loop, and also that they're very brittle in coming up with those. That means if you make minor changes, they will wind up making the wrong um, um, criticism. But there is a possibility that they can be used for that sort of style critics. Um, and then most recently, Linz actually was working on this stuff where if you are essentially looking at a video of a particular action being done, you can say whether or not you have problems with the way this action is being done. In general, people tend to have a lot more hidden preferences than they write in the model. So one thing, for example, that would be in this in one of these videos is if you are hand, if the robot is handing somebody a knife, you know there is no difference between handing the knife with the knife and pointing or the knife and pointing towards the robot from the correctness of the plan, but from the style of the plan, you know the humans might be very worried about the, you know the, the wrong end pointing. Do you see what I'm saying? And those things essentially, this is actually now with GPT four V, not GPT four. And so you can do a lot more style-ish, style corrections. And one of the things they were doing is checking how reasonable are the style corrections, it, criticisms it's giving. We, they didn't actually combine it into a complete model to actually improve the policy because that's much harder in general, okay? In general, style critiques are actually harder to handle for basically any logical systems to begin with. Like for example, if uh, 
you give an you know a paper to people and they say looks good but make it better uh, you know it be writing can be much better or something that's like a style critique and it's very hard to operationalize it because that's like a global thing okay it will be much simpler if they said looks good make section 2b coming after section 4 that's the thing that you can do you know human you know, students want advisors to give that kind of critique than the style critics and so, but then, so there is this issue of how to make sure that your hope is that the next guess hopefully would make the advisor either lose interest and say good enough, or it actually improves according to the advisor. That's the same thing here too, because the style critic can be used to generate the next candidate and you see whether the style critic is happy. Okay, so that's another thing that you can do. The last, which is least interesting to some extent, is LLMs for format change. They're extremely good at it. As I said, they can convert anything into iambic pentameter. Somehow that just, to me, the amazing thing that I can't do. Um, and so there are two places where you can use that um, you know, problem uh, format change. One is problem specification can be in natural language and incomplete, and you can use LLM to improve the specification. You can also give reformat the candidate plan into different formal representations that make sense to different critic critics. And this is stuff that LLMs are better at doing. Okay, then, then uh, and again, interestingly enough, as I said in the beginning of the talk, we always thought style is hard, content is easy. In a weird way, for LLMs, style is easy, content is hard. Factuality is hard. Okay, so, um, yeah, so one of the things we did way before this, this was uh, CAPS 21, we used GPT-3. So there used to be a cottage industry of people who would take hand, you know, natural language plans on the web and convert it into formal specification. That's a style change. That's basically taking prose and converting it to iambic pentameter. Imagine writing an NLP system that takes prose and converts into iambic pentameter. It's very hard. So you would come up with a bunch of cottage industry, like in you know, a different, different systems, try to say it's slightly better, slightly better, et cetera. We too were part of it for a while. And um, I think we had a paper in each guy at some point of time. But then the interesting thing is when GPT-3 came, we, it was easy that actually its ability to convert plans from text to you know, formal representation was better than any specialized on-demand technique. So that's one thing that we are very good at using it for. So that is GPT-3 to plan. That's just essentially taking text plans and converting it into formal representation. Um, and, and then you know other people have done that, but this was like you know, from 21. Uh, again, as I said, LLMs can be using to used to translate goal specification to natural language. And um, some, I think as I said, there are better ways of doing it, worse ways of doing it. The ones that some people outside have done is converting goal specification to PDDL specifications, where you are not changing the specification, you're just changing the form of the specification. The more interesting one says the specification is incomplete and with the human in the loop, you're trying to flesh out the specification. There is work of both types. I think the first one is much easier to some extent, which basically involves putting parentheses to some extent at the lowest level, you know, um, on the natural language thing. Um, but, um, so LLMs for translating natural language goes to this is actually this paper, LLM plus P, essentially just that. They, they repeat the point that in fact planners in LLMs can't do planning. And then there are, and then they say they can, however, be used to take the PDL specification given in natural language to convert into PDL representation and then have FF solve it. It's doable. There's nothing wrong with it. But I think we can be a lot more ambitious. I hope you got out of that. Okay. This is like the somewhat lower hanging apple, okay? Um, but, um, and then, you know, AutoTamp is another system which basically does the same thing except it does this conversion to STL, which is like a more, you know, like um, um, more specialized um, rip, you know, the syntax, the formal syntax. In general, this is where you actually can see robotics people jumping up and down saying we can actually give, we can actually spit out arc joint information from LLMs with no guarantees, right? And that's again, you know, just format change. And again, normally format change again is not guaranteed to be correct, but there's less likelihood that there are major issues there. Same way when RAG systems, when they summarize what they took 
by you know by retrieved and they summarized, they can still introduce hallucinations, which is why I said Tom Dietrich saying, is there a way from asking them to stick to what is given and only summarize it, don't use your background knowledge, which looks kind of sad that they have all this knowledge, but we can't depend on them to use it because if they use it, they might actually start writing summaries that don't exist. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, but that's the that's also the thing. So, epilogue, which you thought never came, would never come. So, the broad lessons, as I said, is I kind of talked about what they can't do, and maybe some of you are a little bit more surprised, and some of you are more skeptical. And so, I'll have fun evening trying to argue with you. Um, but essentially, they can't do a bunch of things that have been claimed, and uh, but they can be very useful in the LLM modulo framework because they are very good at guessing pretty much all sorts of things. And you can use that in this sort of LLM modulo framework. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a pretty useful way and, you know, of actually using their um, abilities. And as I said, that's actually, it's not just shoehorning LLMs, because as I said in that uh, two thesis of knowledge representation paper, this allows humans to, users to give the problems they want solved, and you give as many guarantees as you can. As again as saying, you know, this problem, take it somewhere else, we can't handle it, which is what a classical solver will do. Um, and again, I think we talked about LLM roles in planning, but basically, as I said, they can do the, they can help you with the model, they can help you with the problem specification conversion, they can help you in coming up with the style critics, they can help you with the reformulator, and most importantly, they can help you with the plan guessing. And in the case of meta controller, which I didn't go as much other than the discussion with the TOT, they are summarizing all this pooling and summarizing all the critiques. They could do the summarization plus prompt diversification. That part also LLMs can be used. Okay, there are multiple things they can use. As long as the critiques are there who make sure that no unsound plan is going out, you have all the guarantees. So this is generate test with the test being a good gatekeeper and the generator trying, you know, using the generator for, you know, its good abilities. Um, and I talked about, I hope you'll remember that what planning involves just getting knowledge as well as doing the actual interaction resolution. And that's the second part. That's the thing that LLMs are not good at. And that's the thing that you have to keep in mind. Anybody says they can do planning, ask yourself, are they doing interaction resolution? If not, why not? Maybe their domain doesn't need interaction resolution. A domain is a happy-go-lucky domain where nothing ever fails and you can essentially merge plans by taking a plan from here, a plan from there, and just concatenating them. But very few domains are like that. Very few worlds are like that. And if they are not, then you will fail unless there is an actual require. Okay? Um, and then as I said, why people might be making the claims they're making because they're basically either unwittingly, uh, hopefully not deliberately, but unwittingly pieing off the interaction resolution part to somebody else are looking at the domains where that winds up not being important. Um, and even as I said, even for the verification claims, they tend to look at verification that is style verification rather than formal correctness verification. Weirdly enough, we think for humans, correct, you know, style verification is harder. I mean, like you pay, I, how many of you, by the way, <laughs> saw that the Christopher Nolan thing where this Peloton instructor gave a very stringent critique of Tenet, the movie. And he was like flabbergasted, right? You have to be a New York Times critique to say this. The reality is nobody knows how to critique movies. There's no actual formal way of saying this is good, this is bad, etc. There's no simple way. And so in fact, because of which the Peloton instructor can be a critique, so can LLM. Whereas if you are talking about, is this very simple problem of the coloring of this graph correct, which is a simpler problem, not everybody gets to have an opinion unless they know how to actually check the constraints. So sometimes in civilization, the harder problems, everybody has an opinion. We have an opinion about where the world came from, where the God is, what, whether or not you know, X country made Y virus, all these nonsensical things, we have opinions. But there's a difference between that and you know, the formal verification with respect to model. And, and so keep that in mind that you know, style verification is something they can do. And the very last thing is planning in the age of LLMs really should be using knowledge-based methods, which is like a weird thing to say, but four years back, you wouldn't have agreed with me. 
because four years back, it was still deep reinforcement learning. If you are not using pixel level RL, you are not, you're taking stuff from people and that's cheating. But as I said, if you take stuff from people, a single person, it's cheating. If you take it from LLM, which is being trained on everybody's stuff, that's not cheating because Sam Altman already gave it to you free. And this is an actual advantage for us. We should think of how to use it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in the planning in the case of this team is essentially this million dollar question. How do you use do planning? You're having a doddering know it all, ready to give any kind of knowledge, action effects, task direction schemas, cases, et cetera. In fact, one slide I missed is case-based planning used to be a thing. And I would say that they would actually put cases in the library and retrieve them piece by piece. Now LLM stitches a case together out of thin air, and then you can have LPG corrected or a verifier basically, you know, modified, critique it. Those are the kinds of things that we should be thinking of because this thing is available free. It's, it's no longer costly for you because they already trained you. Okay. Um, so that's the LLM modulo framework and I'm going to stop there. And thank you for your attention. And it's 5.30. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take until 6 o'clock or until I fall apart. But thank you. Thank you for your attention. Bye. Any questions? So I guess the, the main question that remains is really how chain of thought really works and 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 how how does it sometimes get to do planning right or wrong, right? And in in the um, language community, uh, now there's some hypothesis that has emerged for um, I guess in context learning, how does that actually work? And at the end of the day, I mean, in context learning is a type of prompting. Chain of thought is also a type of prompting. So I guess a hypothesis there for uh, uh, in context learning is that uh, we've got these large language models that are essentially just predicting the next token using conditional probabilities. Right? Yeah. But then those conditional probabilities, they, uh, they're computed by you know, transformers. This is a complex model. So perhaps it's, it's inferring some latent variables. Mm -hmm. right? And and I guess the idea is that in the uh, in 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 context learning you have a bunch of tokens that provide um, evidence for potentially some of those latent variables, like maybe some underlying topics, and then that's how it gets to somehow produce uh, good answers sometimes with in context learning as well. Yeah. So I guess my question is. Can we explain perhaps in the same way what's happening sometimes when it works with chain of thought reason? Again, all, so all I'm so all I'm saying is first of all, two things. One, I'll answer the question and I also tell you a joke um, because it's the end of the day, and it's you know it's an AI meta joke. So the thing about CRT is it may very well be the case. After all, okay, all of you know by now that the prompt changes the conditional probability table. Right, and it's not, first of all, I don't even understand why they call it in context learning because all of this has been computed beforehand and the prompt has been added by you. The question is, you are now, you the human are now in this weird situation of trying to figure out what magic words should you say in what order to the LLM such that it actually improves the right conditional probabilities. That doesn't make my life easy. So my one of my points is, if AI, you know, remember the good old AI, people used to actually have this situation in planning where planners were so slow in that people will go into the search queues of the planning, so planners, and rearrange the nodes. That's a sad life if for, you know, people in general. So AI should make my life simple, not make it harder. And, and to give COT, if it is supposed to be easy, I should write, it should be obvious. It should be the way I would basically maybe talk to people, right? That is at least the usual wink, wink assumption in the COT. But whenever you put this up, people will say, maybe you didn't give the COT in the right way. What if you tried? And I'll argue, I'll submit to you that the onus is on Ellen to make my life simple, you know, and, and let me give this joke. I mean, I, it's nothing against this question. I love this joke and you should also remember this. So there are these uh, 
guy is, uh, you know, come, his friend comes visiting and then uh, they go, the, this guy takes uh, his friend to this club and, uh, and then they're hanging around and then suddenly somebody stands up and says 33 and everybody starts laughing. And then after a while, somebody says 71, everybody starts laughing. At that point, this friend is very surprised and he asks the guy, hey, why are they laughing like that? He said, well, no, we, this is a joke club. We tell each other jokes and we have told enough jokes over a lifetime that we have basically cataloged all the jokes. And here's the big catalog of all the jokes, you know, one, two, you know, three, three million. You just go pick the joke you want to say and put the num say the number and, you know, people will realize that you're telling the joke because all the jokes have been told anyway. So, and then you will laugh. So the friend goes, goes to the catalog, looks at and then comes out and says, 374, pin drop silence. Then this guy looks at his guy, guy and says, how 374 is a really, really funny joke. How come nobody is laughing? And then the friend says, it's in the way you tell the joke. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what you were. If you would say the COT1 and COT2 are saying the same thing, and yet LLM only works for COT2, not COT1, I would say then COT is not really what is helping. I mean, listen, LLM is not actually following the, the fact, the, 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 the procedure. You are following what is the way to tell LLM in fact, there was a time, if you remember, I think even people do still do this, that if you put magical characters, magical words in the prompt, certain interesting behaviors will come out of LLMs. There's, Twitter is a great place to hang around to figure out all crazy stuff that people are doing with LLMs. And you know that's true, it actually happens. But is that supposed to help me? My point is, if LLM is supposed to be AGI, in a sense, I should be able to talk to them. The, the whole point of COT is nobody ever said, there is a magical incantation that you need to convert what you want to say it into so that it can use it. Then nobody will use COT. And in fact, I would argue that that's vacuously true. Vacuously true because it's an existence proof because it's any arbitrary you know, uh, conditional table and you can essentially, by giving some prompt, you can get some conditional table. That's just an existence proof. I want it to be more robust. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess that that hypothesis um, with uh, the language community, I, I guess the way they, they would explain it then is that when you provide steps, right, you're effectively like it doesn't matter like you said what you say, it's in how you say it or perhaps the topic of those steps, and and the topic is some sort of latent variable in the sense that. The large language model can infer. So, so may I ask and then, one question? Let, so let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah. So then when after that it does the planning, what it ends up doing is that it has implicitly recognized the latent topic in a way that it will then uh, come up with a step on that topic that always it would not have come up with probably, right? So so in any case, this is the hypothesis for like how maybe it can come up with step A in the same way as step A, That's, and then after that step B and step B. My, and, 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 so my and point is, up, right? my so point is, is I don't, I don't know how many, there's a large number of people. Were you there when I talked about the four different ways of doing COT for PDDL domains? I don't know, because some people are coming in and going out, because that was the whole point of that, that we did COT at the domain independent level domain specific level, goal specific level, goal class, goal class specific level, goal specific level, and very specific, you know, um, uh, sort of like a, um, a lexicographic stack thing. And only the lexicographic stack works. If I started this way, I stopped here, I would say, yeah, looks like COT is working. And this other stuff is the way I would tell people normally, you know, I mean, I, I can read from here, surprising them that you're Pascal and you know that in blocks world, right? <laughs> in blocks world, right? You can put all the blocks on the table and rearrange it in any block stack you want. And it's an extremely simple idea. It's only 2x of the optimal. And we give that, it won't do it. And we do it for just a single stack with all the blocks on the table. It doesn't generalize. So my point is, there is a bias that I'm ready to give. I mean, the story you told is plausible. The question is how easy it is for me to write the COT that will get me that story. How do I say the you know, joke number such that people will laugh? 
Okay, everybody will think that I just have to say the number, but that's the whole point of the thing that there is apparently a way in which you have to put the same information and that should not be my onus. And I don't know what are all the different ways I can do. And in fact, there's this crazy stuff that's going on, which is called the prompt optimization. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, which is given a very specific subset of a distribution of problems, I'll spend like a ton of time to figure out what is the right magical incantations to use such that the performance on this small distribution is optimized. The question for somebody like you with machine learning background is what happened to generalization? This is not worth it. If I have to tell people at the level of every problem, I have to change the COT and you are not generalizing beyond that, then it's not very useful way to, you know, make the, use the LLMs. That was my point. Yeah. Well, so I, I agree with you. And I think the language people would agree as well. In fact, with their hypothesis of, of like this latent topic, they, they did some experiments where when they do their in-context learning, normally you're supposed to provide examples with the right label. So instead, they simply provided random labels, but the idea is that it's the right topic. And then interestingly, it worked just as well with the random label. So then that was essentially proving that it's not doing some form of few shot learning, but it's still, uh, I guess, inferring something maybe about the topic so that then it, it can still infer my, my, like an answer on that topic. My only point right? is that I'm not sure that we are at all disagreeing. Yeah, we're You are agreeing. just saying when COT works, they have a hypothesis as to why it might be working. Yeah. My question is how often does COT work? And given the claims, you would think that any reasonable way of solving the steps of the problem, the way I would talk to people, would work. And the reality is it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. So I guess, I guess, yeah, we agree. I'm, I'm just trying to maybe provide some more explanation, because at least on, on this no, hypothesis more of, of like when it, it might When it work. works, it works this yeah. way. That, yeah. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. I mean, I didn't talk about it. My question is, how often does it work? So for example, when it comes up with a plan, it happens to be correct. There may be an interesting way of explaining when is it actually happening to be correct when it gets the plan. That's a worthwhile thing to do. But I'm interested also, equally interesting thing, which I mostly spend time here on, is most of the time it actually makes mistakes in coming up with the plans. Enough number of times that, you know, the one time it winds up being correct, you know, the few times it winds up being correct, there may be alternate explanations. I mean, this is a great explanation. I think it seems like one possibility, but approximate retrieval and, you know, fine tuning on top of it um, would also improve the guesses. Yeah. That's also right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. I'll just make a comment as someone from the planning community as well that I think we have to remember with humility that that uh, PDDL is also not uh, full of magical incantations that are very normal for us, but but not very normal for lots of other people who are who are not experts in You're talking in about writing the syntax. You're yeah, talking the about the syntax. Yeah. Well, syntax no. So, so the, syn the, the syntax, the syntax, but also the the intended interpretation that we need complete information. That all information about the state has to be but, but conjunctive. That the notion that that clear block is totally disassociated from from on mm. a b mm. that the, the notion that clear should be defined as being there's mm. nothing on top of it but but that the system will not know that 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 we can't have disjunctive information that we can't have incomplete information that that we that we assume that actions are deterministic there are many many things that, that we do that are that are not natural to the domain which which we do and that that we as encoders of pddl understand the magic of and and we encode in a particular way to make it it work which is why when we teach this we see how difficult it is for people to or to to write knowledge bases how difficult it is for people to write knowledge bases because of the intended interpretation of the the way that we're writing things and and because of the syntax we're using so so i think we we rem need to remember our humility as well La natural language is is so so the there are two points. First yeah. of all, I don't know what part of my demeanor gives you any suggestion that I'm not the most, you know, modest and person with the humility. It's just amazing. I mean, I'm the one with the maximum humility. And secondly, secondly, most importantly, 
if you remember, there were slides very specifically talking about everything you did say. It's just that in, you know, it's a question of that degree. I did specifically say, are we shoehorning LLMs into planning? Which is basically a question that ICAPS people will ask. And that was basically an answer saying, look, I mean, that was the thing that, you know, there are many things. The two thesis of knowledge representation is exactly that point that we want to take the problems that people have and give as much as you can provide in terms of guarantees. Saying that the expressiveness constraints exist in planning doesn't open a free for all that anything that LLM says is good enough. I think there is a better world that combines both, which is exactly what I was saying. And even when I talked about what is planning and what LLMs are good at, I also pointed out very specifically what planning people completely push under the rug. You and I know that KEPS is this workshop that nobody goes to other than that guy, Lee McLuxkey. Everybody else is basically doing search, okay? But it's very important that, I mean, honestly, I live in Twitter, so I can't say things that cannot be defended. And so I agree with you. It's just a question of maybe the sense you got was somehow I wasn't showing proper uh, humility. Was, That's was, just me. I no, think. no, I was just defending defending Pascal because I think I think there are lots of things that are that are magical. I I also I guess the other point I wanted to make was was that that um, verification is with respect to the model. Yeah. So you can show that that your plan is correct with respect to the model, but 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 your model may be wrong. That's correct. And and so I think we 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 also need to remember that verification doesn't mean that it's right. Yeah. It just means that that given the model that you gave it that the plan will do and and the that the actions are deterministic and they work in the way and I know you know this. I just I just No, I know. Yeah. That, Again, yeah. I think yeah. I didn't want to but, spend but, too much time yeah. but for the people are trying to make this picture here, I didn't talk about much, but in 2007 time frame, I was essentially asking with planning people that you shouldn't be assuming that complete models are given and all we care about is HS deep community in planning workshops because oftentimes models are incomplete. And I actually made up this thing called model light planning and I talked about robust generating robust plans with incomplete model knowledge. And this whole thing is essentially a spectrum with full model with the traditional planning with no model. Um, and the point of course is when you don't have any models, the guarantees you can give reduce. Interestingly, I'm living the other part of that life essentially. So in fact, I argue still that this could be very interesting time for model light planning, but I didn't want to bring that up because I was the only guy who had that name. So well, even I mean, knowledge uh, people who did plan synthesis from first order logic theories, the 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 premise is that it's incomplete, and if you can't and and, and so it is a form of model light. Yeah, it's just a did we it wasn't called model light, and and that that you can only entail what you can entail from what you have the description That's that true. you've given, which is by definition incomplete. And Cordell Green, nineteen sixty nine, mm -hmm. and all the people. People who talked about planning it and yeah. plan program synthesis and planning back yeah. in the yeah, early but I mean, 70s. The, the and... whole point I think is that how do we get best of all worlds? I mean, better than just that's part of my point that you know neurosymbolic whatever. If there is a thing there, it can't be pipelining. It has to be figuring out and understanding. And I know completely well that you know people in this room. I was lucky enough that they know both sides. And but my worry is also that there are also people who tend to assume that. Planning has sort of been invented with LLMs to some extent. Not you, not you, but you know, you have to read enough of these papers. And, and so it's important to do work. You need to understand both the limitations. In fact, if I get to go back to my very beginning, I mean, it's like to actually extend a technology, you need to understand both its great points and its limitations. If you just want to be an influencer, on the other hand, it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. I might have a demeanor of an influencer, but you know, I'm still a researcher. So <laughs> yes. Thanks for this. I mean, I'm professing by saying that I agree 99% with that, but I'm just trying to extend the argument. I mean, to a large extent, the evaluations that you present over here, I was just wondering, are they well grounded? I mean, no matter what prompts you give. These are text-only models. You're asking block kind of things. The grounding probably is not sufficient. And if so, is the evaluation okay? I, I, 
I was actually surprised that that uh, question because the grounding is essentially. So first of all, we can make simulators and show that all the plans that they come up with will fail in the simulation. Okay. The interesting thing about model-based planning is, with respect to the model, is the plan correct? That's the grounding. If you prefer a simulator, I can make a simulator which does what the model says and show that this won't actually generate the block. Okay. In fact, my opposite worry is many of the claims. Um, that are made in general about reasoning and planning in the you know from people who don't have background in reasoning and planning unfortunately tend to be not grounded exactly. like at all because essentially it will just be I, we asked a bunch of people and they liked it or something you know that doesn't work and that and the anecdotes don't work grounding is extremely close to my heart which is exactly why there is like an entire you know slide if you remember about different ways verifiers can come into play Verifiers basically tell you whether or not a plan is correct. Okay, so you can have model-based verifiers, you can have simulators, you can have world models, you can have style critics, etc. And they all have different trade-offs. But I do think that certainly whatever we did was definitely grounded. There's no question. Nobody ever questioned that part. Okay, the part, and in fact, when people, one of the weirdest things uh, is within even, I mean, as, as much as people think this is early days, it's like so many people are interested in AI. I mean, that's great, you know, and, and, and so, so many people, I mean, there's a lot more people are working in it. And so like one and a half years back, everybody was basically still saying, even with respect to this very little topic, that planning will be working, et cetera. And now already, as I said, there's like travel planning benchmark saying travel planning doesn't work. Two months back, in fact, when I read this paper, I assumed that they'll say it will work. Because you would try to ground it in such a way that you don't put enough constraints etc., and, and verifying the constraints. But people are realizing that actually it matters, you know, checking whether the constraints are while thing or not. And so this, by the way, is from a purely NLP people. They have never, they don't even know what ICAPS is. They probably also don't know what AAAI is. And they come up with, you know, this travel planning benchmark, which has 0.6% GPT-4 accuracy. I couldn't have made this stuff. Okay, so my point is, in fact, I would put this back to you and say, when people start thinking about grounding, they will themselves realize that, in fact, the claims they're making cannot hold water. I at least told you what my grounding is. You can make it, you know, I mean, I told you the model, I, to, I can also make it into a simulator. You know, I completely agree with the fact that maybe this is not the only domain. That's completely reasonable. These IPC domains are a particular kind, but travel planning is already a different kind of a planning domain. They actually mostly are about calling various website, you know, web services and checking to make sure that your preferences are satisfied and some hard constraints such as the total amount of dollars spent or anything. It's a very, very different kind of planning problem than IPC people will look at. And the interesting thing is, again, even though I mostly talked about planning and I gave examples from PDL, there's a bunch of these things here which transcend that. And hopefully you can figure out. I didn't make those claims because I was mostly focusing on the PDL planning. But in my own mind, I think the many of them translate. Yeah, I mean, the reason I was mentioning is because NLP community, most mm -hmm. recent data sets for benchmarking, when it comes to reasoning, uh, are not very well grounded. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think 10 to 6, I can say this, um, that <laughs> I think NLP community is having some existential crisis to some extent because it's not, they used to be NLU, and they became NLP, and NLP can be done much better by LLMs. Most of the things that they were taking credit for, interestingly, the reason they suddenly discovered reasoning and planning, because that's the one thing actually is not in anything like the format change, anything like summarization, et cetera, LLMs are doing much better in their benchmarks. And, and by the way, you have to, I mean, there's a much bigger thing that we can be talking about, MMLU. The benchmark-based evaluation is very worrisome. Somebody, basically, nobody actually decided what is the way to you know, evaluate generalization, generalizability, et cetera. And so we now have the situation of Google claiming that we are better than GPT-4 because we are 2% better. Like, you know, it's like, you know, seven out of 10 dentists now, you know, prefer uh, Crest, this thing. The point, of course, is on the same day, somebody wrote a paper I almost wanted to like hug the guy that showing that MMLU essentially is an extremely brittle benchmark. 
it's as informative as US news and world rankings of universities. And you can play with it. And in fact, by just changing the order, all sorts of things. So in fact, there is an optimization problem there. Instead of prompt optimizing, we should be optimizing how to ask questions such that our MMLU score can be worse and improve. I think at some point of time, and again, it's the best of times, the worst of times. In the best of times, in the sense, this the amount of excitement in, in AI community, but especially old fogies uh, and young people like Sheila uh, is just amazing, right? You know, people, I mean, I lived through a time when people will say, why are you doing AI? Couldn't you be doing interesting stuff like databases? Now it turns out everybody in my data, my department, as well as the university, are actually only doing AI. They just didn't realize it. And they're telling me. And it's an amazing time to be alive. But at the same time, it's also true that a whole bunch of things just take, you know, are basically let, we're letting it pass by. But a computer science, from a computer science perspective, that would never have passed by before. Bunches of things today wouldn't have gone through any reasonable classical computer science reviewing thing. And yet, I think NeurIPS is an amazing conference. And I'm amazed that some of these papers got in. Okay, and, and both different notions are amazing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for the uh, tutorial and thank you for the quiz. That's very educational. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I guess people agree that AI is for optimal solutions, but you know, for most language model, say planning or agent, they are doing success ratios. So, you know, there's a gap between success and optimal. Uh, no, uh, no, that's not this, but go ahead. I, yeah, mm. so I mean, uh, probably, you know, the current language model are not good enough. For example, for Game of 24, that's the first year uh, programming course, right? Just recursion, we can do it. But say just like, say GP4 plus TOT, they can only do 70%. I I think that, that's, that, that's not even AI paper. They cannot solve 24 problem. So, I mean, should we do something more radical rather than just doing, say, prompt, prompt engineering with GPT-4? Probably we should do fine tuning or even pre tuning, building some new models for planning and agency problems. So I'm, I'm not completely sure whether you're making a comment or a question. So um, yes, I, I mean, think there's certain so parts of it which are- So we build new models rather than just based on GPT-4 or the current best language? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. But on the other hand, one of the interesting things is hardware lotteries. You know, uh, how many of you have heard of the hardware lotteries part? I mean, like, for example, when risk became, you know, we are again old enough, I know some of us, that uh, we were told that like Randy Davis came to um, AAA 84. Oh, my God, I'm dating myself like crazy. But uh, um, and said, what you need is list machines. OK, two list machines per desk to improve the productivity. Right. And you hear about risk machines, they went away because the risk basically won the lottery. I mean, forget about all the list part. I mean, risk won the lottery and people kept improving the risk part. And then we never went back to CISC, uh, you know, architectures. Similar thing, there are certain things that we are good at doing. And so we are likely to do more of commercial interest just dominates, you know, explore. I mean, despite whatever I said, this is not. I mean, my saddest part is the, I'm stuck with having to sell these kinds of t-shirts because I can't start a startup about all the things LLM can't do. You know, if I just say LLMs do all this stuff, then I get a startup, right? But in general, that's what happens. And, you know, basically start, commercial entities are interested in exploiting the existing technology. Researchers should be interested in looking beyond, but interestingly, and in fact, as I point out in that um, AI as in research, natural science, things have sort of shifted. Now we have become essentially let, you know, there's this beautiful statement, um, uh, the, like this French general is in the cafe and he sees a whole bunch of people running outside and he says, let me find out where my people are going so that I can go and lead them. That's what academia has become. Let me find out what Altman is, Sam Altman is trying to cook up so that I can try to make sense and pay him money to figure out what's wrong with them. So that's, you know, you are right that other models should be tried, but we should be admitting that the barrier for entry of that, you know, Jan Likun has been jumping up and down and up and down. I mean, he keeps, you know, pushing this stuff because one of the things he wants, he hates LLMs for whatever reason. And he says they're great. I mean, if I say they, they suck and I just say, they don't suck, they just suck, suck the oxygen out of the room. That's it. 
in the sense there should be other ideas you should be trying to and since this is such an interesting approach this thing everybody is focusing on it that's just a human thing but if yan couldn't get ijapa i call it this japanese model to work <laughs> to get people to pour money into that you know uh, i don't know where you are i don't know the university if you're in university where exactly are you getting you know <laughs> so that's the thing so i think universities still have to look at other kinds of things and they should at least understand what things work what things don't work because commercial entities have no interest i mean if i was running the company i would only take the credit at the thing so i mean one of the funniest funniest things i mean i have a, a, a twitter a thread about this so open ai would get to argue in two different parts of its mouth when you say um, i want they, when they say gpt4 can be used as search engine they are essentially saying it can retrieve correct information when new york times says you retrieved our articles he said no 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 we are never supposed to retrieve we can't retrieve <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it both can't be true, and we are sitting there and taking both in. And reality is, it is indeed true that approximate retrieval is what LLMs do, which is why they don't actually work for search. I still don't. I'm perplexed by people using perplexity. I said it, okay, because I don't understand what is stopping you. You couldn't call the Google. You want somebody to summarize Google with additional extraneous information. you know this is the tiktok generation doing search okay and you might very well be paying for it one of the things you have to remember is google has this orthogonal i mean the basic whole ir literature had this orthogonal way of evaluating the trust of the source different from what the source says there is it's impossible to make sure that llms are going to repeat stuff that cdc says as again as q and on crazy say other than by rlhf and rlhf apparently snuffs many many sparks that's the other thing one of the funniest things was if you look at the sparks paper it says don't do this at home because most of the sparks have been extinguished uh, afterwards and it's because they basically rlhf the system and i don't know how many of you have seen one flew over the cuckoo's nest it's like when you did rlhf it basically you know the magic is gone now because it's now not sexist not racist and apparently also no sparks okay this is the reality this is the same reality you and i are in and you know we just collectively you know selectively pick what we want to believe in and once in a while we can take in universities i can i can and you know i can take the step back and say you know what makes sense what doesn't make sense thank you thank you okay it's it is 6 o'clock i will be here if you want to talk but otherwise thank you thank you very much and it's great thank you